many people are believing the Lord for the impossible? How many people this month of September you are believing the Lord for the impossible? You want to see the Lord move? And as you are trusting, as you are believing, so will be your expectations in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much, kings and priests. Let's, let's give them a round of applause. God bless you. God bless you real good. Amen. I want you to just bow your heads and pray that the Lord will speak with you, speak to you rather, as we go into the word this morning. Ask that the Lord will unveil himself. The Lord will come his, cause his word to come to you. The word will come. The, Lord will, the word will stand by you. The, Lord, the word will speak to you in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we'll thank you. We'll bless your name. Thank you for the opportunity to hear your word. We do not take it for granted, oh God. We do not commonize it this morning. Because we know that you do a whole lot with your words. It's actually with your words that you have done all that we have seen, all that we have heard, and all that we will yet see and hear. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege to come before you again this morning, for the opportunity to hear your word. We ask that this word will do us good this morning in the name of Jesus. For as many as will listen after now via YouTube, Lord, via Spotify, we ask in the name of Jesus that faith will arise in hearts in the name of Jesus. The Father, like Abel, we will keep bringing sacrifices that are acceptable unto you in our lives in the name of Jesus. Let your word come, O oh God. I ask that you impart grace to every hearer, not just to hear, but to be doers of your words in the name of Jesus. Spirit of the living God, we thank you because you are here. We ask Almighty God that you will move as you have intended in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to Hebrews 11 verse 21. As we move on in this journey, we've been on a series, um, Living by Faith, Hebrew 11, Hebrews 11 gleanings. Amen. And today we move on to the seventh character or the seventh person. We move on to the seventh person, that is um, Jacob. We move on to Jacob this morning for the past how many weeks? Hebrews 11, 21, let me read from the NLT translation. It says, it was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons. And bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, he blessed each of Joseph's sons. Joseph had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. He blessed Ephraim, he blessed Manasseh. And he bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. This is what we'll be today and I trust that the Lord will reveal himself to you as you hear you know as we look into the life of Jacob over the past few weeks we've looked at the fact that faith according to the NLT translations um, we've looked at faith we've heard the definition again and again and we've been looking at the different lives the lives of several men and a particular woman it's only one woman we've looked at you know yet that modeled faith and we are saying that faith is like a tree. And on, on that tree, you have fruits, different fruits, you know, hanging. It's still faith. But in different people's life, we see them, ex, um, you know, um, demonstrate faith in different ways. We see them demonstrate it. Or, well, it's different things that um, God recorded or God decided to focus his attention on for several of them, for you know, different reasons. He knows the reason. He just wants us to see the different aspects of faith, the different features of faith, the different things that if faith is present in your life, you will be moved to do. Amen. And these things are meant to help us as we keep on in our own journey in God also. So we'll, we saw the definition, the New Living Translation says faith is the, it says it's the confidence that what we hope for will actually or certainly happen. 
It says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will certainly or actually happen. It is the assurance that what I haven't seen is the assurance of what I have not seen. I haven't seen it, but I have an assurance that this thing exists. I have an assurance that this thing will come to pass. Amen. Um, we looked at the life of Abel. One thing that we saw with the life of Abel is the fact that faith listens to God. He listened not like his brother um, Cain listened. He listened such that he was able to bring an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. Amen. You know, we said that it wasn't for lack of God talking to Cain. But he, doesn't he just did not listen the way his brother listened. His brother listened, you know, listened to God and he was able to bring a sacrifice that was acceptable to God. We looked at Enoch and we were told that it was by faith that Enoch walked with God. He walked with God and he, he did not have to go through the vehicle of death. He, he, he walked straight into immortality. He embraced immortality, which is a promise that God has given to the new... Um, that is given to the, to, to the to, what's, what's it called, the, the, the believer in Christ Jesus. That is, a, that is a promise that the Father has given to us. We know that um, before Jesus returns, there will be a crop of people that will embrace immortality. Amen. There will be a crop of Christians that will not need to go through death. They will not need to kiss death to be translated, you know, to be with the Father. You know, they will be, they will embrace immortality. And we saw that in the life of Enoch. Enoch walked with God, and God used him to demonstrate that this reality exists in me, and we are going to experience it. Amen. Some people will experience it. Amen. We looked at the life of Noah, and we learned that uh, fear, no, no, faith fears God. When you have faith, you have a godly fear. For God that makes you do some things or helps you not to do some things. You know, the godly fear that Noah had helped him to do the work or to take seriously the work that God committed into his hands. Amen. The Lord told him, build an ark. Even when there was no rain, there was no sign, nobody had seen rain. You know, it didn't look like it, but he took seriously the assignment of God for his life. And he was able to do it. Through it, through what he did, God was able to start, you know, with the human race afresh with the family of Noah. Because Noah was moved with godly fear to obey the Lord. We saw obedience in Abraham. That when you have faith, that faith will move you into obedience. That, that was what, because for different people, God highlighted different things. For, uh, for Abraham, God highlighted obedience. The Lord called him, come out of um, you know, your father's house. He said to him at another time, offer to me your son, whom you love, Isaac. And we saw Abraham at all of those times, he was in obedience. Even when he had reasons to, you know, falter and here and there, but he obeyed God ultimately. Amen. We saw um, the life of Sarah also, that by herself she received strength to conceive seed. And we saw in the life of Sarah that, you know, it's not completely up, up to God to bring to pass whatever promise he has made to you. God always wants the partnership of his people. Amen. He wants us to lay hold together with him. If the Lord has said anything to you, what is your own part? That was what God, or that is what God highlighted, you know, in the life of Sarah. That Sarah had to by herself receive strength to conceive of the seed such that the promise of God to herself and her husband could come to pass. Amen. You know, the life of um, Abraham, um, obe obeying, one of the things we saw in the life of Abraham is the fact that obedience most times will not come cheap. It will not be easy. Because, you know, he came out of his father's house. But when it was time to, I'm sure it wasn't easy doing that. When it was time for him to sacrifice his son, it wasn't easy, but he went ahead to do it. And it, it's recorded in the scriptures as if he actually sacrificed. Because as far as God is concerned, it was as if it was a done deal. He had seen that guy gone. He had seen himself sacrificing him. The Bible talks about a people that, um, you know, I think Psalm 15 says something like, who we are sent to the hills of the Lord, who are the people that will walk with God, who are the people that God, and he said, one, one of the characteristics he said is, people that swear to their own hearts, that you've made a commitment, you have said you will do this, even when it becomes difficult, you realize that your word is your bond, amen. 
Let's see verse, um, verse 4, the last part of verse 4 of this Psalm 15. You know, it's giving characteristics of people that were ascend before the throne or the mountain of the Lord to worship. He says, he's talking about believers in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he who honors those who fear God. These are the kind, this is the kind of person that will ascend to that hill and worship God. He said, he who swears to his own heart and does not change. He makes a promise, and even when it becomes difficult, when it becomes hurtful, I don't know if you remember anybody, you know, in this category also, Jephthah. You remember Jephthah? That the Lord said to him, the Lord raised him up as a deliverer for Israel at some point. And his name is listed also in this um, Hebrews 11. If you look at it, I think verse 32, you have Jephthah there. You know, that is the company of people that the Lord is raising. These are some of the things that the Lord wants us to see from the lives of these heroes of faith. And, you know, um, add it to what you have. Add to your faith. Add all of these things to it. He did, he, you know, he made a promise. Even when he was going to hurt him, Jephthah stood by it. His daughter came out. He had promised God, when I go and I win, the first thing or the first person that come, maybe he was expecting a dog or he was expecting a servant. I wouldn't know. But unfortunately, it was his daughter that he really loved. It was, it was hurtful for him. It was painful, but he stood by it. He had made a promise, and he said, I've made a promise to God. I will not go back on this. And he offered the daughter. Amen. Um, last week, we looked at um, transmission of family faith, how we looked at Isaac. And what we, what, what we, what we narrowed, narrowed it down to for Isaac is the fact that Isaac had faith that submitted to the will of God. Amen. Faith submits to God. Faith submits to the will of God. That's one of the things we, we see because left, for, left to Isaac, Isaac would have allowed the blessing of Abraham go to who? Esau. But he learned through his dealings with God that, you know, this is what God wants. This is the will of God and he submitted. He blessed, you know, the, 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 he blessed the, the two sons. Blessed Esau, blessed Jacob, and he gave to each one what the Lord wanted him to give. He passed on the family blessing unto Jacob, even though Esau also was blessed. So, uh, you know, we see different things in all of these lives. And today, we just want to go a step further and look at the life of um, Jacob. Let me read for you again the message translation of this Hebrews 11:21. It says, by faith, by an act of faith, rather, Jacob on his deathbed... Blessed each of Joseph's sons in turn, blessing them with God's blessing, not his own, as he bowed worshipfully upon his staff. By an act of faith, Jacob on his deathbed blessed each of Joseph's sons in turn, blessing them with God's blessing, not his own, as he bowed worshipfully upon his staff. You know, um, when we look at this particular uh, picture, it looks as if it's, a, it's, it's almost similar to what we saw last week with Isaac. Isaac blessed you know, Esau and Jacob. But there is, a, a, there is a twist to this. There is an addition to this. We saw that he blessed the children, but then something was added to this. It says he, worship, he, he bowed worshipfully upon his staff, upon his rod, upon his staff of authority, if you would say, upon his walking stick. Amen. That was his walking stick. And, you know, God does not, everything that is put in the scriptures and in the Bible is intentionally put in there. When, when he says he bowed worshipfully upon his staff, he bowed, he held the staff and he bowed on it, worshipping God. That was an act of worship. You want to say to yourself, what does the sta staff, what does it stand for? What is this thing about him worshipping God? Okay, we understand that he blessed. Even the blessing that he did here is quite different from the blessing that we saw in Isaac. Maybe I should just quickly say that to you and then we'll move on. You know, the blessing that Isaac demonstrated that we saw last week is the fact that he was passing the family blessing. He was actually... Um, you know, pointing to us who will, who, uh, the, who will, who will be um, fortunate to, to be the, the um, lineage of Jesus Christ. Amen. The struggle that last week, um, when we looked at the life of Isaac, Isaac wanting to bless Esau, and then God saying, this is the person I have chosen. 
for, for that particular blessing, laying hands on them and saying, he was actually blessing them. He blessed Jacob so that Jacob could be the lineage through who Jesus Christ would come. But this particular one, blessing these two sons, he was blessing Ephraim and Manasseh. You know, you agree with me that Jesus did not come through either of them. So this is a different kind of blessing here now. This, was, this, is, this blessing, this one isn't about the lineage through which Jesus will come. Because Jesus came through the lineage of who? Jacob and inside from Jacob, who? Judah. Judah. But here we see him bless Ephraim, bless Manasseh. And we will come to that much later. You know, some of us might want to argue. I've heard a pastor preach one time in a recently, maybe like um, four weeks, five weeks ago. And he was just, when he got to, he was talking about, um, I think, Exodus 3, verse 6. The Lord says in Exodus 3, 6, he says, I am, and you will see that um, reference again and again in the scriptures. Then he said, he was commissioning Moses here. He said to him, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Quite a number of believers will not have a problem with God being the God of Abraham. Plenty more people will not have a problem with him being the God of Isaac. But being the God of Jacob, do we know who Jacob was? If you know the story of Jacob, so, you know, you might want to contend that why is God the God of this person? You would want to say, you know, does God know, you know, everything about this person? Why is he? And at some point, that place, I think in Leviticus 20, what is that now? Maybe 26. Let me see. Leviticus 26, verse 32. Let's see that. 2642. He also says there, he said, I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I'll remember also my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham as well, as, as well, and I will remember the land. So you see him putting Jacob every now and again into the, into the same place with Abraham and Isaac, and you are wondering, you know, Jacob, what we know about Jacob, Jacob started out well. Even before he was born, when you look at um, Genesis 25, the Bible says Isaac and his, and his wife, Rebekah, were married. For 20 years, they did not have any child. Um, Isaac prayed for his wife, and God heard his voice, and God blessed them with pregnancies. After a while, Rebekah recognized that she was having, you know, you have um, maybe movements, and it was becoming a bother to her. That I just got a jab here, and then another jab here, another jab here. Can this be, you know, what's going on here? She was, she was a first-time mother, and she was becoming confused. She went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her that there are two nations inside you, you know, and two people will be separated from you. And the Lord said to her that the younger would actually be greater than the older one, and the older one will serve the younger one. Before none of them were even given birth to. So before Jacob was born, God already chose him. You will see when he was, if you look at his story also, I think that same Genesis 25, when he was coming out, Joseph, Jacob already started showing us his true color. God already said that I have chosen him. He will be the leader here. He will be the greater one. When he was coming out, you know, the life of Jacob was filled with it. You have a lot of intrigues with his life. And, you know, there is a lot of temptation that I'm going to resist this morning. Because we can go in different. His life is a very, very, um, very colorful life. If they say somebody's life is colorful, you understand what we mean. As in no dull moments. As he's removing hand inside this one, he's keeping hands inside another one. Before you say Jack Robinson is doing something else. Jacob was someone that in, in all, you know, when I look at his life and I summarize it, I'm like, this is somebody, somebody that really wanted the blessing of God for his life. He just did not know how to go about it. Amen. From the word go, when they were born, you know, time will not allow us to look at all of these things. Okay, well, let's just look. Genesis 25. When he was born, um, let's just look a bit at his life and then we'll come back to this Hebrews 11:21. So I'll read for you verse 26. This was at their delivery. He said, afterward, that is after Esau came out, afterward his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. As at this time, Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah bore the two of them. 
So in coming, introducing Jacob on the scene, the way he came out, he came out with a lot of drama. Your brother had gone ahead of you, but was holding on to his heels, as if saying to him, brother, just watch your back. I'm behind you. He wanted, like, be the first, I don't know, be the firstborn, because that was what he demonstrated eventually. As soon as he became, became of age, he cooked pottage, and the brother was saying, give me. I don't know, I'm thinking that might, have, that might not have been the first time, you know, it's possible, that somebody was asking for food. Ah, take now, you're my brother, or let's just share it. But this time around, I'm not going to do all those um, Osho free again. I'm going to take something for this. We saw Jacob beginning to bargain with him. I'll give you, but you're going to give me birthright. You know, if we look at his life, there is a tendency for you to think this guy is just, you know, always out for himself, looking for number one. Number one is himself. Oh, you know, how things will be okay for me. I want to be the head. I want to. But when you look at it in another light, you are like this person, Esau did not value what he had. But this was Jacob that valued that birthright. It was as if he knew that there was something about being the firstborn. Amen. There was something about having this blessing of the first person. He, he wanted it. He coveted it. He went after it. Even though he did, he, he did it on, you know, he did it through dubious means. He was a man of dubious character. His, his name here, he was named what? Jacob. If you check it up, it is called some supplanter, cheater. He was like a conniver. He was always bargaining, amen? He bargained with his brother. Much later, you will see him bargaining also with God. You know, he tricked his father. As in his story is, um, you know, Pastor Shun was saying to us last week that all of us are writing stories of our lives, right? We are writing you are, your legacy. You are writing it with everything you do, everything you don't do. We see Jacob here. The, the, the story that he wrote of his own life is started out chosen by God. He hadn't done anything. God said, I have chosen you. You are going to be the, you know, the greater one. You are going to be saved by your brother. You know, it was, it was settled. But then as soon as he started becoming of age, the first thing he wanted to do was to cheat his brother. And he said, well, maybe not cheat, because he gave him something in exchange. Promise me, swear to me, that they're going to give me your best rights. And the brother did it. Much later, you will see him um, deceive his father. That's in Genesis 27, verse 24. We know the story. The father, you know, um, wanted, to, 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 wanted to bless the sons. He wanted to bless particularly Esau. Wanted to, bless the, 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 wanted to bless Esau. And he said, you know, go make venison for me and bring it. But then he deceived his father. Deceived his father, got the blessing. After this time, he had to be on the run. He was on the run, left the house. He met God. When he had not, do you know he did not go looking for God? I'm just trying to make you see. One, he did not, before he was born, God already said, I've chosen you. He came out, came out on the scene, did this, did that. God still came to him as he was running away from the house, you know, running away from his brother. The Lord came to him. And the Lord said to him, can we look at that, script, that, that portion of the scripture? Genesis um, 27, 13 to 15. Let's see how generous the Lord was to him. God was not even asking him for anything. 13 says... Mm, no. That's 28, sorry. Genesis 28 from 13. It says, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Notice that God has not asked him for anything. Verse 14, Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. This was God 
you know, in his generosity, in his sovereignty, coming to Jacob and saying to him, he did not say, you know, in some other, with some other people, you might hear the Lord saying, you know, for Abraham, the Lord said, leave your father's house. He asked something from Abraham, right? For Jacob, we can't see anything here. The Lord just came and he was benevolent. The Lord was just magnanimous. The Lord was just you know, lavishing his love upon him. I will do this for you. I will do that for your, for, your, um, for your seed. I will do this. I will do that. At the end of the day, hear what our person, how he responded to the Lord. Then Jacob in verse 20 made a vow saying, if God will be with me. Did the Lord not say I will be with you already? You know, this person, if you ask at times that who is Jacob, we can very well look at it, twist it and say Jacob is us. At times we are like Jacob. We like to have something after we have worked for it. Doesn't that look like, all right, let me pay for it. There is a place for that. But when God comes and he's saying, this is what I want to give to you. And you know, the whole, this series of faith that we are doing, I'm just trusting God that we will understand. Because this is the whole essence of it. Like we can summarize it with the life of Jacob. What God is saying, because one of the things, if you look at all the, all the stories or all the different lives that we have examined, you will realize that these people who were told the stories of their lives, we were told how these different people pointed towards Jesus. Did anybody take note of those things? If you look well, that is why they say things about, when we say history is Jesus' story. Have you heard that before? When they say history, they say it is his story. Has anybody heard those have you heard it explained like that before? That history is actually his story, Jesus' story. Everybody that, and you know, when you read the scriptures, that is, this is, it should always lead us to Jesus. When we look at the lives of these different heroes of faith, you will realize that all of them are mirroring or pointing to Jesus, pointing to something that Jesus has done for us. And the whole idea is that faith we arise in our hearts to receive what Jesus has done for us without us wanting to labor for it, wanting to work for it. Amen. It is by grace. Amen. It is by grace. It's not until we've, we, we do something. Jesus has paid pr the price for us. God is available to us. He has promised us a whole lot, but he's asking that we will have that confident assurance that what I have promised you will come to pass. For Jacob, the Lord said to him, I will do this. I will do that. But here Jacob in verse 20 says he made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. That is, you know, you will be my God if you will do that. And he said, I will even give you a 10% of, you know, whatever you give to me. But, you know, we might look at this and say it is, um, it is laudable, it is commendable. But if you twist it or look at it very well, God came to him without asking him for anything. He said, I'm going to do all of these things. What do you think our response should be? Yes, O oh Lord, I receive. But he said, if you will, it was as if there, there was that thing in him, in Jacob, that would always bargain. Would always want to, you know, uh, you know, bargain, you know, make a deal. It's as if he was used to that, make a deal. But God wasn't asking him for a deal. But let's keep looking at his life. So after this, he got to Laban's place. And then he started experiencing his own medicine. His medicine being that he was a supplanter, he was a cheat. Amen. He was someone that was, you know, he, he was dubious, he was corny, he was, he was like that. He, he was being given his own medicine. He wasn't paid, being paid back in his own coin. As he landed, the first thing that happened, well, it wasn't immediate, immediately. He was saying, I want who? Rachel. And Laban deceived him. He thought he was a, a, a deceiver. He met his match <laughs> in his father-in-law, um, father-in-law to be. Father-in-law gave him Leah instead of Rachel. He was deceived. I believe that you know, because at times, when, the, the, they say the evil men do live after them, right? Especially when you've refused to go the way of God. When God is saying, you know, this is what I've carved out to you. You want to have it, you know, another way. Because he didn't have a reason to run. If his mother had not helped him, you know, to say, let's cheat your father or let's cheat your brother out of these things. But somehow God made him realize that this, see this life that you are living. It will not amount to anything. At the end of the day, it will be sorrow, it will be pain. 
He got to the place. He said, I want to marry. They deceived him, gave him the wrong person. He did not find out till the next morning. I don't know how. Don't ask me. But the Bible, the scripture says it was in the next morning he realized he wasn't Rachel. It was Leah. And he said, why did you do this to me? Long and short, he, he, he eventually got Rachel. But you know, he had all of those challenges. Eventually, he went back home. You remember, went back, you know, went back home. Um, and on the way, he met with the Lord. He met with the Lord again, right? He had a fight with the Lord. You know, when, you, when, you, when, when we come to Hebrews 11, and his name is even mentioned, one would think that that is even what God would have highlighted. Where he wrestled with God, you remember, all night. That it was by faith that he used to wrestle with God. Because he said to the, at first, the scripture said at first he thought he was fighting with a man. Read your scriptures. It says at another point he felt he was fighting with an angel. And then eventually he realized it was God. And when he realized it was God, God was like, leave me, it's almost day. He said, no, I'm not going to leave you until you bless me. This was a man that was hungry for something. Maybe he just, he just had that crookedness in him. And it's like you and I. We are hungry for something, right? We are hungry for increase. You are hungry for what? Stability in your life. You are hungry for, you want to be satisfied. There is an hunger, there is a desire, just like Jacob. But may you find out to go about it the right way, the God's way, so that you don't weary yourself out in the name of Jesus. May we receive easily what the Lord has made available to us in the name of Jesus. Without bringing hurt and sorrow to ourselves. So he fought with the Lord and then eventually he crossed over. Went back home to be with Esau. And you know, um, what happened? He had children. His children or his sons at some point deceived him. Can you remember that? Because he was showing favoritism favoritism rather, to Joseph. He loved Rachel. He struggled hard 14 years. It's not easy to get just one woman. And then the woman did not even stay with him for long. He gave birth to Joseph, and not long after that, she was giving birth to Benjamin when she died on the way. They were going back home that time. So Rachel did not even get home with him. You know the kind of pain and agony that would have been in his heart. So when the child, when eventually they have, he, he had two children or two sons rather from Rachel, he poured his love on Joseph. Poured his love on Joseph and that brought problem into the family. To the extent that the brothers decided, let's just sell this one off. And so Joseph was sold off and then he was deceived to think the man was dead. For years, he thought his son was dead. When they came back to him and told him that, you know, is this your son's um, 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 Quotes, he said, yes, I'm sure that my son is dead now. And he said, I will go to, grave, to the grave with my head bowed. I'm going to go to the grave, you know, with sorrow in my heart. So as at the time, they came back to him and told him that Joseph was alive, it was difficult for him to accept it. The scripture says when they talked to him that his heart stood still. He was numb. He could not believe it. And the next thing he said was, okay, well, let's go. Let's go see him. And after I see him, I will die. At this point in time, he had become a man of regrets. He had looked, you know, see all of his sojourn, you know. He went, you know, to Laban's house. He came back. And then his son was um, sold off, taken away from the house. He, his wife, he had his, his wife was lost. His um, um, most favorite um, son was gone again. He had become a very miserable person. As at the time that Jacob got to Egypt to go be with, um, what's his name, with um, Joseph, he had become a man of regrets. He gave like a summary of his life when he met with Pharaoh. And what he had to say about his life was not a good thing at all. You know, I'm bringing this story so that you can see how he came to this place of blessing the two sons. He had gone through, when, let's look at where Pharaoh was asking him about himself. That's Genesis 47, um, verse 8. Pharaoh said to Jacob, this was after he got to, to where Joseph was, how old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage or my sojourn on earth are 130 years. Few and evil are these days of my are these days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. Do you agree with me that at this point it was it was in regrets? He wasn't so proud of the life that he had lived at this time. 
He had sojourned and he had come to a place where he was full of regret. He was saying concerning himself when Pharaoh asked him, he said, if you ask me to summarize my life or the, the summary of my life, he said, there have been few compared to my father's. My father's lived longer. So what I'm bringing, you know, using this to bring down to Ross, and you know, for as many as are listening or will, will watch later, is it pays to stay with the process of God for our lives. He pays not to complicate issues for ourselves. Jacob was not a straightforward person, but God is not ashamed to be called his God. Because you will see, God constantly will say, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, I'm the God of Jacob. I'm not ashamed of Jacob. You know, you and I, can, we can identify maybe more with Jacob. Where God is saying, go this way, you think you are smarter, you want to go in another way, or you want a shortcut for this, all those shortcuts at the end of the day, they just had to somebody's journey. At the end of the day, he said, my years have been few, and if you ask me, they have been evil. They've not been particularly pleasant, but God gave him another chance. When he met with um, Joseph, you know, I don't think we have time to read that. That's in Genesis, because, you know, his life, there is, there is so much that one is just compressing. We can stay on plenty of things. You know, one can, it's just that we're looking at Hebrews 11, we're looking at his faith as God wants us to see. Because there are several things you can say about Jacob. But what God said, what God, you know, highlighted in his life is at the end of his life. You want to ask, did he not have faith before the end of his life? Of course he did. He did some things, but this is what God wants to reckon with, and there is a purpose in it, and that's why we are focusing on it. When he got to, um, what was he called? Got to um, where um, Joseph was. I think they settled in Goshen. And, you know, he said to his people, let's just go, let's go and meet him. When he got to Joseph, he was full of, he wasn't really excited. Joseph saw him, and Joseph was happy. Let's see if I can read up a bit of that. That's, don't turn to it, I'll just read. Genesis 46, 29. So Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. And he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Not just for a short while, a good while. I'm sure you can imagine that picture. You can see it in your mind, right? See what um, jo Jacob said. He said, and Israel, by this time he, had, he, was, he was being called Israel. And Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I've seen your face. You are thinking finally we are reuniting. Is that what you would think somebody that is excited to leave. It was done. It was like, I'm tired. Let me just go. But God gave him another chance. As at the time he spoke to Pharaoh, he said, my days have been few and evil. But at the end of the day, we will see in Genesis 48, when he was about parting, and that should be like 17 years, God was gracious to him. When he met Joseph in 46, Genesis 46, what he was saying is, Let's just, let me just die now that I've seen your face. He thought he was just going to die, but God gave him a whole 17 years. By the time he was ready to go in Genesis 48, his story had changed. He had moved from a man that was full of regrets into a man that had come to reckon with God. A man that had come to a place where he accepted that he, has, he, he believed he was already he was accepted with God. He believed that all his trying to, or his shortcuts, all his being corny, being a cheat, being a deceiver, he, he came to a place where he re realized that See, God has loved me. God has accepted me. I am accepted in the beloved. I don't need to do anything. Let me just go ahead with what God has said for my life. And when he was living in Genesis 48, you know, he talked as a different person. When he, when he was blessing those two sons, he was talking like someone that had accomplished something. And that is the beauty that can be in our own lives too as we journey with God. Amen. He started out, you would say, as a spiritual dwarf. But he ended his life as a giant. As at the time he was in this Genesis 48, verse 1 says, Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob also was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, This is 17 years after he arrived. When he arrived, he was ready to go. He was ready to die. He wasn't expectant. He wasn't, he wasn't excited about anything anymore. He was full of regret. He was like, I've just wasted my life. I've just gone up and down. What was I even looking for? Self? All those shortcuts at the end of the day. What have I gotten out of it? It's just been pains and pains. The wife I wanted self is gone. Blah, blah. You know, he, he, he was full of regret. But God was gracious to him. A whole 17 years he stayed and he lived in that 
that land of Egypt, such that when he was ready to go, he was a different person. What testimony that he gave about himself had changed. Amen. So he said to Joseph in verse 3, he said, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. This was when he was going to Laban's house initially. Now he's calling to mind that encounter with God. Because he can look back and he can see that God has changed me. And that is what came to a place, that, that, brought, that was what brought him to a place where he could worship God. So he, is, he blessed the children. Let's see his blessing of the children. Okay, let me read verse 11. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact, God has also shown me your offspring. Is this sounding like someone that is grateful to God now? Yes. Is the story changing now? Yes. Now he is remembering the encounter he had with the Lord when he was running away from home. He is remembering it with gratitude in his heart. That's what I read for us before verse 3. Verse 3, verse 4, he remembered what the Lord said, that the Lord said to him, I will make you fruitful. I will multiply you. I will be with you. That blank check that God gave him initially when he was going to Laban's house, he was coming to terms with it. He was coming to reckon with it. You know, after he had gone laboring by himself, trying to make things happen by himself, eventually he's coming back and he's saying, you know what? God has been good and God has been gracious. Verse um, 14, then Israel stretched out his right hand. You know the story that, you know, he was old and frail. And then um, Joseph brought the two children because he told him, if you, we don't have all the time to read. If you, if you go through that chapter 48, from 1 to maybe like 10, you will see it. He was recounting and recounting how God said he will bless him and do this and do that for him. And he told Joseph, he said, see, all the children that you give birth to after I came to this land, they are your own. But the ones you gave birth to before I came here, I'm adopting them as my own children. They will be my children, and I'm going to put my hands on them and bless them. And then he looked up, and he saw, you know, children with him, and he said, who are those? Joseph said, they are my sons. He said, wow, bring them, because he was just talking about those sons. He didn't know they were there. He saw them. He said, bring them. And then Joseph brought them. And Joseph would put Manasseh here for the father to put his right hand because it's considered that the right hand is, you know, it, it will, will give out the greater blessing. It's supposed to go on the head of the firstborn. And then the left hand should be on the head of Ephraim. So Joseph positioned them correctly before his father. Manasseh here and Ephraim here. But he wasn't going to be like his own father. You remember his father, right? Isaac, that blessed them not knowing who he was blessing. He didn't do that mistake. Even though he was frail and old, but he could still... You know, he was still, he was still alert. So he crossed his hand and put his hand, this right hand of strength, this right hand of power, this right hand, you know, of greater blessing upon the firstborn, and he blessed him. And by doing what he did, you know, fine, he blessed, he said the greater one would serve, would serve the younger one. He put the greater blessing on Ephraim, and he said, he blessed Manasseh also, you know, but what we'll, what we'll see in what he did is the fact that he elevated these children. Amen. He elevated them to the position of their uncles. That is the same thing that Jesus has done for you and I. Amen. He elevated them. The, 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 the um, inheritance that should come to the 12 sons, you know, 12 sons of, of, of um, Jacob, you know, Levites were not given a portion. They weren't given inheritance. You remember the Levites, right? Levites are part of his um, children too, people from the tribe of, the, uh, of Levi. It, it didn't, it, those ones were not given inheritance in Israel, amen, because God is their inheritance, Amen. We know those people that belong to that group here. How many people belong there? Don't say it's kings and priests too. It's all of us. Amen. It's not just kings and priests. But then they are portion. God was the portion or is still the portion. He's still our portion. For the Levites, they weren't given inheritance. So you have 11 children, right? And then one child was given two portions. And that would be Joseph. Joseph was given two portions because his two, his two sons were elevated to the position of their uncles. And then Israel, or Jacob as you would, laid his hands upon them and he, he blessed them. Amen. He blessed them and I believe what he also did to them is trying to tell them these children were settled or these sons were settled in Egypt. I'm sure in that 
would have been looking like the prince, princes in Egypt. Don't you think so? Their father was like second in command. But Joseph or Jacob was trying to also say to them that don't forget that this is where you don't belong in Egypt. You have an, a portion, you have a part, you have an inheritance among the children of Jacob or the children of Israel. Amen. We might be on the earth also. But you know, but, but what we have in Christ Jesus, the inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus is also saying to us that we might be in the world, but we are not of the world. Amen. There is an inheritance in Christ Jesus for you and I. And so that was what um, Jacob did for those two children. He elevated them. He helped them to lift up their gaze so that they will not completely be thinking that they belong to Egypt. That you don't belong to Egypt. This is where your lot is. This is where your, your, your portion is. This this is where your people had. You have to identify with your people. And so he blessed those children and then he worshipped God. He had come into a place where in worshipping God and leaning upon his staff, I'm sure his mind would have gone back to the intrigues that went on in his life, his early life. Amen. How he connived, how he swindled people, how he tried to be a cheat here, how he tried to be, a, 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 you know, be a cheat here, be a supplanter in all of that place. And at the end of the day, he realized that, see, I have been accepted in the beloved. God has loved me. God has poured his love upon me. God has given me, you know, himself as my inheritance, because that was what God said to him when God met him in that Genesis 25, when he met him at, um, at Luz. The Lord said to him, I will bring you back. The place where you are right now, I'm going to give to your children. It is not by what we do. It is by us aligning with the plans and the purpose of God ultimately for our lives. Amen. So we, the, 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 the picture of Jacob that we see here is the picture of someone that went his own way, tried to get things for himself and by himself, and at the end of the day, he had a lot of sorrow, he had a lot of regret, and he would have gone down to the grave like that, but God did not allow it. The Lord helped him. Amen. The Lord came through for him, and he made a switch from being a very... Um, a man of regrets into a place where he could look at God and worship God. What does it take to worship God? Worshiping God, you know, the, the picture that is presented for us in that Hebrews eleven twenty one 21 is a very beautiful picture. If you look at, um, I think, the end of Genesis 49, the last verse in Genesis 49, after he blessed, you know, after he blessed the sons of Joseph, you know that that was in 48. In 49, he called all his children, all his sons, and he blessed all of them. At the end of that, when he blessed Reuben, Simeon, all of them, all the, all, the, all, the, all the children that came out from him, the Bible says, and I just like it, verse 33, I think, the Bible said he lifted up his legs, put his legs on the bed, and he was gathered up to his people. He died, verse 33. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, that is, you know, um, blessing them and saying to them where to bury him and all that. He drew up his feet into the bed and he breathed his last and was gathered to his people. He died. Do you think he died as a peaceful, fulfilled man? That is just a picture I believe the Lord wants us to see in, the, in Hebrews eleven twenty one. 21. The Bible said when he was old and frail, at the end of all his sojourn, he had tasted between life, quote and unquote, death. He had come to recognize that, see, when God says you are loved, when God says you are blessed, when God says, uh, you know, you are accepted in the beloved, take things on his own terms. Don't try to, you know, um, like they say, reinvent the wheel. It's important, part of the things we learned last week is that you will recognize what the will of God is for your life and stick to it. Uh, if Jacob were to come back and tell anybody, you know, advise anybody, I'm sure that is what he would say. That see, where God has blessed you, what God has outlined for your life, can you just stay with it? Can you try to understand it and live it out? It's easier, it is cheaper. The Lord came to his help, came to his rescue. He didn't die a miserable man. He did not die. He thought he was going to die immediately he got to Egypt. He wasn't excited when he got to Egypt. He was like, let me, after everything, Jacob, the Bible says Jacob fell on his face and he, 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 he cried a long while. Jacob was, no, did I say Jacob? Joseph. Joseph was excited. He was like at long last. 
You know, this is reunion. What you will think is, oh, wow, we'll treasure every moment that we have now, son. You know, that is what you would expect, right? When that kind of reunion is happening. But for Jacob, no. Because he, he was almost out. He was down and he was almost out. There was no excitement as at this time. But God eventually helped him. 17 whole years, he still lived in, J in Egypt. And when it was time to go, he left as a fulfilled person. God did not allow him to die as a, you know, a man of regret and a man of sorrow. That testimony that he gave to, that he gave to um, Pharaoh, when Pharaoh asked, the Lord turned that testimony around for him, such that when he was going, the testimony he gave, I didn't even read you that testimony. Let me read it to you from verse 14. Then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. Verse 15. And he blessed Joseph and said, but in blessing Joseph, you know he was blessing Manasseh and Ephraim. He said, God... Before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Are you feeling him? Bless the lands. Bless the lads. Let my name be named upon them. And the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. The scripture says in Hebrews 11:21 that when he was old, Jacob blessed these children, and then he leaned upon his staff, and he worshipped God. Hear the testimony that he was given. Hear the way he was talking about God. His story had changed at this time. Amen. He had experienced a new dimension of God. And so he could worship God. He could come. So when there is, when there is faith, in your heart, it's easier to worship God. That is what that is the summary. There are several things that God might have wanted to point to in um, the life of Jacob, being an example of faith. But what it has pleased the Lord to, uh, to highlight in the life of Jacob is the fact that Jacob worshipped at the end of his life. At the end of his sojourn, he worshipped God. What does it mean to worship? To make someone the focus of your adoration. To make someone the object of your, of your emotions. Amen. Jacob was a, a grateful person eventually. This is the high point that the Lord would want you to see. When you remember Jacob, this is what the Lord would want you to remember. That Jacob demonstrated faith by worshiping me. Amen. Faith worships God. That is a summary, you know, of the faith displayed by Jacob as the Lord would want you and I to remember it. For his own, you know, in, in his infinite mercy, he's pointing out different people and highlighting different things. But for Jacob, the Lord decided to go straight to the end of his life. After all his sojourn, after all the intrigues, after all the up and down that he has done, trying to make hands meet, at the end of the day, God is saying here that by faith, Jacob worshipped me, leaning on top of his staff, holding that staff and remembering that I've become old. I've become old such that he couldn't even stand by himself. But as it was, it was a beautiful, what other way do you want to, for instance, go other than this? This picture, I don't know, but if you, if you look at it very well, this is a very beautiful picture. There is no old person trying or want, looking forward to when he will eventually die that does not like this kind of picture. Don't you think so? Several people go facing death and they are full of anxiety, full of regrets, full of sorrow. God helped Jacob that his situation became changed. If he had died immediately, he got to Egypt, or if he had not even seen Joseph at all, he would have gone like that also. Going, not happy, not fulfilled, not gracious or grateful to God in any way, but he died a good death. He died, I'm sure he had people all around him. You know, when Jacob, um, Joseph came to him initially, I'm sure it was only jo Joseph that was with him when he was talking to Joseph and then talking about the sons I'm going to. I'm sure the other sons were not there. But much later, he called the other sons. He blessed them. A beautiful way to exit the earth as a fully satisfied person. 
So I believe one of the things that the life of Jacob is, is also supposed to paint in your mind and in my mind is at the end of our lives, this is a beautiful way to go. You are going, blessing people, and then worshiping God. Amen. It's a beautiful way to exit. Still in faith, he hadn't said what God self. You know, maybe bitter with God. God has not been, you know some people leave earth thinking that God has not been good to them. God has not been fair to me. But that is not your own lot. Your lot is that like Jacob, we will keep walking and walking with God. Enoch walked with God, you know, forever. You will walk with God also. And when it is time, if Jesus tarries for us to live, we want to live with this kind of, um, we want to live with this kind of picture where you are blessing lives. You are blessing men, you are blessing women and you are still very much in faith. Jesus, the Lord God Almighty, is still very much the focus of your worship, the focus of your affection, the focus of your adoration. Amen. When it's all said and done, this is the life of Jacob. Thank God that the Lord did not allow him to go the way, you know, he didn't get what he, he, he bargained for, what he went after. The Lord in his mercy came after him. And that is the same story with you and I. Amen. I want you to take communion this morning, remembering Manasseh and remembering Ephraim, how they did not work for what they came into. You also have not worked. The Bible says it's, it's by grace that you have been saved. It is by grace. I want you to receive again, call to mind again, the fact that you have not merited anything. The Lord has just decided in his infinite mercy to, 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 to plug you into the family, into his own family. And he has said to us that all things are yours in the name of Jesus. All things are yours. He's also saying to us, even though we are pilgrims on the face of the earth, the same way these boys were pilgrims in Egypt, their grandfather was saying to them, do not forget who you are. You have a lot in the, you know, among the people of God. Your lot, your portion is with the people of God. Do not forget in all your sojourn, in all your, in all your pilgrimage, remember that your lot is with the people of God. Your lot is in Christ Jesus. Even though you might be in touch with Egypt, you might be eating the food of Egypt, you might be drinking the water of Egypt. You might be eating the food of Egypt, you might be eating the, uh, drinking the water of Egypt, but the, the, the grandfather was saying to them, just know that you belong to the God of Israel. You belong to the strong God. You belong to the high and mighty God. You belong to the high and exalted one. You belong to Yahweh. God is your lot. God is your portion. He is your reward. In the name of Jesus, I want you to put your mind, cast your mind back on God this morning and say, God, I thank you because you are my lot, you are my portion in the name of Jesus. You are my inheritance. You are my inheritance. You are, you, you, you are my inheritance. You are the summary of my life. It is in you I live and move and have my being. I want to, re I want to be conscious of it, oh God, that you are my lot. You are my lot. I bring to remembrance again this morning everything that the Lord Jesus has made available. Even as I go into this month of September, I want you to talk to the Lord, that the Lord will help you to call to mind the things that are yours in the name of Jesus. May we not fall into the trap that Jacob fell into at the beginning of his life, chasing after what was not lost. When he had everything, before he even walked at all, before he cried his first cry, God said, I have chosen you. You are going to be greater. The Lord already chose him. In the same way you have been chosen. You have been chosen to be great. You have been chosen to be mighty and the Lord will help you to be mindful of the election by grace that has found you. The election of God that has found you by grace. I want you to pray this morning and ask that as you go into the month of September, we dedicate ourselves again. We will not, we will not, um, we will not, you know, go after what is lesser than what we have been given already. You will not, you, will, you, won't, you won't cheat yourself in the name of Jesus. All things are yours. All things are yours. All things are yours. The Lord met Jacob and said to him, I will give you the whole of this place. And the Lord did not change his mind. He didn't change his mind. Thank God for 
his mercy that found Jacob at the end of the day, so that his toil is going up and down, eventually was not in vain. He came back to God. He died blessing the children and worshiping God. He died referencing God, acknowledging God in all of his ways. He had become a humble person. He had come to terms with the love of the Father. I want you to just remember this morning as we take communion, bring your mind back to all that the Lord Jesus has done for you. Father, we ask that you will help us. I want you to just go ahead and pray. Help us to remember that all things have been made for us. In the name of Jesus, help us to remember Remember that Jesus paid the ultimate price. He paid the ultimate price so that we can have access to the use of his name. So that we can have access to the use of the blood of Jesus. So that we can plead the blood and have results. Lord, you made the word available. You made the Holy Spirit available. We are blessed in all ways. We are blessed in all ways. Father, help us to bring this to mind all the days of this morning month of September, that we will not go struggling in our own strength, in our own might, in the name of Jesus. I want you to just go ahead and pray that the Lord will help you to acknowledge him all through this month of September and beyond in the name of Jesus. Lord, help us to reckon. Let's reckon with the finished work that the Lord Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. The whole essence of this Living by Faith series is so that we will be pointed again and again to what Jesus has done so that faith will rise in our hearts to live the kind of beautiful life that you have intended for us so that we will not be subservient, Lord. We will not live below your expectations for our lives in the name of Jesus. We will not go suffering ourselves with what you have not intended for us in the name of Jesus. Father, we call our mind we call our minds to remembrance that we are accepted in the beloved, that you have blessed us. You have blessed us with everything that pertains to life and godliness, that we are a blessed people. We are a blessed people. You are for us. The shout of the king is among us. We cannot be cursed in the name of Jesus. We have more. There are more that are for us than those that are against us, Lord. Help us to remember this month of September. September and beyond, in the name of Jesus. Father, we declare that this month we excel in strength. We excel in strength in our bodies, in our minds, in the name of Jesus. Pray for yourself. Everything you lay your hands upon this month, it prospers. The city of Abuja opens up to you in the name of Jesus. The month of September is hearing your voice to favor you. Those that know you not, they come to your aid. They come to help you in the name of Jesus. People will jostle to just be a blessing to you in the name of Jesus. You will call one person. Seven will answer you in the name of Jesus. We declare that the wells that we dig, they begin to produce water in the name of Jesus. We declare declare that the greater one is for us. You are for us, oh God. You live on the inside of us. It is in you that we live and move and have our being. Everything answers for us this month of September in the name of Jesus. Lord, we declare that we will live every day of this month, worshiping you in the name of Jesus, putting our focus, our attention upon you. Lord, you will receive worship from us because our hearts will sing songs this month in the name of Jesus. We will be fulfilled in the name of Jesus. We will be satisfied in the name of Jesus. The type of testimony that Jacob gave, he said the angel that was with me, the God that fed me, the God that was with me. He could identify with you very well. Lord, we ask that that will be our own reality also in this month of September in the name of Jesus. We will not worship from afar, Lord. We will come closer. We will come closer this month in the name of Jesus. All these things that we are hearing, these stories that we are looking at, oh God, will drive us deeper and deeper into you in the name of Jesus. Jesus. 
and everything we lay our hands upon becomes prosperous in the name of Jesus. We declare, Lord, that we, 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 we are busting by the sides, uh, in the, at the sides, in the name of Jesus, busting at the seams in the name of Jesus, experiencing victories, experiencing breakthroughs in the name of Jesus, because this city answers to us, this month answers to us in the name of Jesus. Thank you for good health. Thank you, Lord, for, 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 for blessing our water and our, and our food. Thank you in the name of Jesus. We, we excel in good health. In good health, even in our minds, we excel with brilliant thoughts in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We honor you this day, O oh God. Thank you in the name of Jesus for the opportunity to partake again of the body of Christ, you know, by these tokens, the body of Christ and the blood of Jesus, bringing to mind the work that has been done on our behalf. Lord, we thank you in the name of Jesus. As we take the bread, we declare the bread is blessed in the name of Jesus in our bodies. As we take the cup, we declare it as a cup of blessing. We drink into the richness of life that there is in Christ Jesus. For we're prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead. Take the bread and the cup. <laughs> 